<laughs> Next, we move to a second work session, which is on the floodplain ordinance update. And uh, Kathleen, would you like to introduce this? And I don't know if Brian or Ken is going to uh, take the lead on, on the presentation on this one. Yes, yeah, so I'm happy to hand this over to both Brian and Ken so that they can discuss uh, proposed ordinance changes for the floodplain. All right. And I, oh, Council, sorry, Brian. Um, I, all I was going to do is just hand it off to Brian. So um, it sounds like he got his audio working. So uh, Brian, take it away and we'll be available for questions. So. All right. Thanks, Ken. And good morning, Chair and Council. Um, my name is Brian Apple. I'm an engineer three in the design section of Public Works. But in addition, I am pretty intimately involved in the floodplain program for Clark County. And I'm here today to speak about a floodplain ordinance update um, that uh, hopefully is upcoming. Next slide, please. Um, but before I talk about the ordinance, I'd like to present some background uh, regarding the floodplain program. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, um, requires a community to adopt and enforce floodplain management ordinances to regulate development and flood hazard areas. Um, you need to be part of this program in order to be eligible for federally backed flood insurance policies. Um, and within the National Flood Insurance Program, um, there is another program known as the Community Rating System. Um, this is a national program that was developed by FEMA. And the purpose of the program is to recognize, encourage, and reward communities, um, sorry, community activities that go above and beyond the minimum requirements of the NFIP. Um, and <clears throat> I want to take a little bit of time in explaining this table and how it works. Um, so, if you adopt just the minimum F NFIP requirements, your community is part of the community rating system and it is considered a class 10. Um, so just doing the minimum, um, as you can see, provides you zero um, premium reductions. However, by implementing additional activities and programs, you award your awarded credit points. Um, and as you get more points, you uh, go up in the CRS classes and the premium reductions for flood insurance policies get greater. Um, and so currently, uh, Clark County is at a class five. And so we experience a 25% reduction in flood insurance policies within the flood hazard area and a 10% reduction if you have a policy and you're outside the flood hazard area. Next slide, please. Oh, apologies. Um, FEMA recently has adopted a new CRS uh, re prerequisite to be a class eight community. Um, and this prerequisite is a one foot, one foot freeboard requirement, um, which includes all machinery and equipment for residential buildings constructed, substantially improved and or reconstructed in a special flood hazard area. Um, and just to uh, make it a little more clear, special, uh, special flood hazard area is essentially the floodway and the floodplain. Um, and with this new prerequisite, if it's not adopted, the community will automatically downgrade to a class nine. Um, and in, so what this would mean for the county, um, is as a class five, like I said before, there's a 25% reduction within the SFHA, 10% outside. If we don't adopt, then those reductions would drop down to 5% um, in both the SFHA and SFHA, or in, in and outside. Um, currently in our code, the county uh, requires a, the one foot free board requirement but it's on buildings only. So essentially what this update will do is adding this requirement to machinery and equipment, um, such as you know, air conditioning, water heaters, things of that nature. Next slide, please. 
And kind of the nexus of this um, update was a community assistance visit that was conducted by the Department of Ecology last May. Um, and what the community assistance visit is, is essentially a friendly but mandatory audit of the county's floodplain program. Um, we got um, the results back and overall the county did very well. Um, basically said that our procedures are effective, our staff are knowledgeable, um, and the one um, deficit area was that the our ordinance needed some minor updates to bring it into compliance with the new CRS prerequisite, as well as FEMA's model ordinance. And basically what the model ordinance is, is uh, an ordinance, basically FEMA's ordinance that identifies the, the minimum necessary requirements to be part of the NFIP. Um, next slide, please. So now a very broad overview of the changes. Um, like we've discussed, the inclusion of machinery and equipment into the already existing one foot freeboard requirement for residential buildings. Some of the definitions in the ordinance were updated. Um, there is an addition of two sections, a penalty for non-compliance and severability sections. Um, there's, and these sections are a mandatory part of the model compliance. Um, and essentially, the penalty for non-compliance um, is set at a maximum. Well, the penalty for non-compliance is, is a pretty minor fine. And the severability section just says that if any one piece of the ordinance um, is deemed unlawful, that does not mean that the rest of the ordinance no longer applies. Um, there is also specifically states that a free board requirement applies to AO zones. Um, these are basically shallow ponding zones and the depth number is basically the depth of ponding that, that is experienced in those areas um, based on modeling. In addition, the lowest floor and under unnumbered A zones need to be at least two feet above the highest adjacent grade. And again, this is an area, A zones are areas that don't have a base flood elevation divined, and they're also um, kind of episodic, periodic, um, shallow flooding areas. And so this is basically just to ensure that um, because of a lack of better information, um, it has been determined that two feet gives a, a good level of protection. And then the final change was an inclusion of a livestock sanctuary construction standard. Um, this might sound a little bit controversial, but really all this um, states is that if you have a livestock san sanctuary, that it just needs to be sized appropriately for the number of livestock that you plan to have in there and elevated sufficiently to protect that livestock, um, which is typically one foot above the base flood elevation, which falls in line with pretty much the rest of the code. Next slide, please. So for the timeline, um, obviously the work session today, then um, planning to go to the planning commission work session in early November, have the planning commission hearing mid-November, um, a second work session for the council, um, late November, early December, and then uh, go to he council hearing in early of 2023. And then um, when all's said and done, submit the approved ordinance to ecology. And next slide. And thank you. Um, that's the question. And if you have any question, or that's the presentation. If you have any questions, happy to answer. Questions? Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. So a couple of items. Number one, given that uh, there will be three new council members the 1st of January, given this timeline, you might want to revisit because the three new council members will not have had this background. So there may be a timing thing on that. The second one, though, uh, item is relating to 
to your floodplain ordinance update and the changes, are those retroactive? That is, are, are properties, buildings currently in place that are gonna have to be a determination made as to whether they meet these new requirements? And if they don't meet the new requirements, will they either lose out on some of their discount or will they have to make changes? Because retroactively making changes could get quite expensive. Uh, yes, um, to the best of my knowledge, and Ken, please correct me if you understand differently, these new updates will not be retroactive. Um, essentially, once they are adopted, then from that time forward, as applications come in, they will be um, set against those. But applications that have already come in, permits that have already been issued, um, will not be looked at again to see if they meet this um, additional one foot freeboard for machinery and equipment. Um, and that's my understanding as well, uh, Council Rylander. I and we can we can verify that just to make sure. But my understanding is that this would be for new applications only moving forward um, for new floodplain applications um, and insurance in in those areas. So, but I can get you a verification on that. So. That's good. I just wanted to make sure we were noting that just in case. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Other questions? I'd just like to ask that you put into um, uh, non-engineering English, if that is even possible, <laughs> reference to freeboard ordinance applies to AO zones using the depth number identified. What does that actually mean? What, what is involved? So and Brian, Brian, before you answer that, I, I, I was, I was smiling as you were reading that bullet too. Um, it, it's such a great question. And I just want to, I want to give Brian a little bit of kudos. He has single handedly uh, reviewed and um, responded to every floodplain uh, application that's come in in the last couple of years due to staffing shortages. Um, and he's worked pretty closely with me on them. And he is an engineer's engineer, especially in the world of stormwater. So if he can't answer it, nobody can. So Brian, with that, go for it. All right. Um, so um, freeboard is um, a term which is essentially a, uh, a vertical space that you leave from the from basically a water surface to the beginning of construction. So when you say a one foot freeboard, you're essentially saying that um, the lowest floor, if the base flood elevation was 33 feet, the lowest floor has to be at least can be no lower than 34 feet. So it has to be one foot above the floodwaters. Um, so in free, so freeboard is just saying that whatever that distance is, it's basically saying a area you have to leave um, above the water surface. Hopefully and, that. <laughs> and Brian, specifically as it relates to the, it, you've listed the AO zones and the A zones. Yeah, um, and so and, something to you and I, but um, it's pretty big yeah. when it's not on a map. So. So an AO zone um, is essentially a shallow flooding zone. Um, it's typically sheet flow, which is basically just water running along a surface. And basically they create ponding, shallow ponding that's a depth of one to three feet. And so what the depth number is, the AO zone itself will show you that area that will be flooded. And then the depth number that is given will tell you what the maximum depth of that ponding is estimated to be. And Brian, can, can you describe where those come from, just the firm maps and, and where, where someone might physically see them uh, if they were to look this up for their property? Um, so there is on our uh, Clark County's website, um, there is a development and floodplains uh, page. And on those there is um, a link to flood insurance rate maps, or otherwise known as firms. And these maps will, will show you 
all the areas of flooding and will identify you know what type of zone and basically the zones are kind of laid out whether or not they have good modeling and base flood elevation or they might not have base flood elevation but it's still larger floods or it might be things like the AO zone um, and the A zone um, where you know the depths are, are sort of limited in terms of the flood if that makes sense so basically an A zone is is one where there's a chance of flooding um and actually a greater chance of i guess flooding over a 30 like of a 30 year mortgage than what they typically think but there is no detailed analysis there's no base flood elevation and so because of this they determined to to essentially rather than have a one foot freeboard have a two foot freeboard of from the highest elevation that's on your land if that makes sense. Um, because, and really that, that is good for the landowner because otherwise what you would need to do is actually hire an engineer, perform a hydraulic analysis to determine those elevations and it's much, much more costly. Um, So this is, I, I would say, FEMA's recognition of that and compromise um, to the landowner without having to do hydraulic analysis. And, <laughs> and please let me know if I, <laughs> like Ken said, I, 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 I am very much an engineer and speak engineeries. No, and I, thank you, Brian. I, I would just say if if you want me to drill into that a little bit more and and try to uh, give any other examples. I'm happy to give it a shot too. I'm not as involved with the, the specifics as Brian is, so I have to have a, a maybe a more visual understanding of it as well. So if you still have a, a additional questions or or need us to cover any of that, I'm happy to give it a shot too. So, well, and we may have more questions later, but for now, okay. Chris, what you said was very clear, and thank you. Hmm. No problem. Thank you. Are there questions from council? Anything at all? Okay, uh, we will draw this uh, work session then to a close. Again, with um, I think uh, the comment that Councillor uh, Rylander made is one definitely to think about for the timing of the next work session. Um, and so let's uh, be sure that we keep that in mind. And thank you for bringing that up, uh, Councilor Islander. I appreciate that. Um, and and with that, uh, and hearing no further questions or comments, uh, this work session is drawn to a close. Thank you very much.